We're going into the place that everyone is being told to evacuate. Something bad is happening every day, 100% of the time. It is not a job for people who aren't tough as nails. What's the scariest thing that's happened to you? Nuclear warheads coming at oh, us. Oh, Jesus. They're like, I'm going to die alone. They don't want to hear that part. They just want to speed up to the success. Either they love to watch you because they love you or they love to hate you, but they can't look away. I didn't even get the chills when you say that. I am so excited to have you in studio. I walked in. Your skin is glowing. We're going to get into your beauty tips later and makeup and hair. <laughs> Everything. Later. Yes. But I want to just talk a little bit about how you grew up, what your childhood looked like. Did you always know that you were sort of destined for what you are now? I knew at age probably 12 or 13 that I wanted to become a news anchor. And that was because my mother, who was the most important person in my life growing up, because I have two older sisters who are best of friends. So I was like my mom's best friend. And I listened to everything that she said growing up. I was her little buddy. And we were watching the news growing up in New York City, local news, and it was probably 1980, 1981, so I was 10 or 11. And this Asian female newscaster came on, which was unheard of. And my mom said, if she can do this, you can do this. This would be a very good profession for you. So she planted the seed and then watered it. So then when I graduated junior high school and you had to predict where you're going to be 10 years from now, I said, New York City anchor woman. So went to college, studied journalism, left Queens, came out to USC. And it's been like I've been on that one track, you know, any summer off. I had an internship at some newsroom. So I knew I wanted to be a broadcaster, but I thought I was going to end my career at 60 Minutes. You know, getting out of news was not anything I ever thought I would do, which now people know me more as host of Big Brother and eight years of co-hosting a daytime talk show. Like every now and then I'll get, aren't you that news lady? You know, because I covered local news before I did national news in New York. And every now and then I'll, I'll get that when I go to New York. But um, I knew I wanted to be on TV broadcasting. What did you like better? News or hosting? I ended up liking hosting better, but it took me a year to make that transition oh. because when you're on the news, you are not supposed to express your opinion. Well, now I know things are very different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll get that. we'll talk about that later. But, but yeah. you know, growing up in the 80s and getting into the business in the early 90s, you weren't supposed to editorialize. So it was very clear what my job was. And I wasn't supposed to show any personality or give my, you know, personal feelings. Then when I went into a daytime talk show, I had to flip the script and do the exact opposite. Oh. And after a year, it got to be a lot of fun. You know, we didn't take ourselves too seriously and sharing personal stories and opinions on things. Um, that was a lot of fun. You know what, though, speaking of you when you were doing the news, I'm reading this book by Morgan Halso, who's this, he wrote this book called The Psychology Man. Anyway, he He's got a new book called Same as Ever, and he was talking about the reason that maybe the news feels much heavier now is before there was a lot of local news, and that was kind of like the world you lived in. Like if we grew up in San Diego, mostly what we read about was what was going on in San Diego. So the chances of something bad happening all the time were rarer than if you're covering world events, something bad is happening every day 100% of the time. And he was saying that it's not that the world is necessarily gotten so much worse is that the stuff we see all the time now is all the worst stuff. On your phone, 24-7, you know, cable news channels, and they got to fill that airtime. So yeah, it used to be if you didn't watch your local news and you want to see what's happening in Afghanistan or overseas outside of your backyard, it was reduced to half an hour at uh -huh. 6.30 at night. Yep. Yeah. It's interesting that you said that your mom pointed to the screen and said, if you can, if she can do that, you can do that. We just had someone come in here that her dad said, you'll never amount to anything. And she said that tape replays in her head over and Janice over. Janice Dickinson. She's 78 years old. Oh. She says it still replays. Did that, what your mom said, if she can do that, you can do that too, replay throughout. I mean, it's interesting you remember that. Yes, absolutely. You know, anytime, like 
I took four, it took me four years out of college to get my first job in front of the camera. I was working behind the scenes for so many years and all my friends from college, they were already in their second, maybe third job already starting at a small market. But with my mom saying that and believing in me and never getting off track, my mom always was supportive. Like I, I never entertained the thought of maybe I should pivot. So I never stopped trying. It's so interesting how that happens for kids, though, because you hear parents that have done the opposite and what that can do. Oh, yeah. Parents, teachers. I've heard the same thing. This one little girl was told when she was in first grade by her teacher, you know, you're not very good at math. And she repeats that script and it drives her mother crazy. She was like, you know, damn that so-and-so names the teacher, like telling her at a young age, you're not you're not very good at math. She believed it. waking up and doing the news when you start to do that is not a joke. People don't understand. I I did an internship at a news station and I could not believe what these newscasters were doing. They were up at 3 a.m. First of all, if I had to have makeup put on me at 3 a.m., it would be like putting makeup on a pig. Like it's you're not so <laughs> you're so puffy and and tired. Oh, and yeah. then you have to get in front of the camera and turn it on. What what is that process like when you're starting out? I mean, it's a grind. You have to be determined. And in the beginning, you're doing your own hair and makeup. And you know, we we don't have professionals transforming how we look. Yeah, your face is puffy. There's you no know, fish tape. There's yes, no. So, but you know, you have youth on your side. And I was so determined that my my first job was in Dayton, Ohio, and you always get the worst shift. So you're alive, you know, in some snowstorm at 5 a.m. You, you already have your face on, you're dressed, and you know, your brain has to be functioning, and you're talking on live television, and you're in the elements. Um, it is not a job for people who aren't, tough as nails because not only what you said, the hours and having to look presentable, but it's also when disaster happens and you see like everyone caravanning out of a situation, whether it's a tornado or a snowstorm or like an oil spill, we as the journalists, we're going into the place that everyone is being told to evacuate. So, you know, when I was in Ohio, we had to chase tornadoes. Everyone else is sheltering and not in place, evacuating. We're trying to actually find the thing that everyone is trying to avoid. What's the scariest thing that's happened to you? When I got sent to cover the war in 2003. So I oh, went wow. um, over first. We went into Doha, Qatar, and that's where um, that was the country that was hosting the United States. And this is before we knew that they didn't have, Iraq didn't have weapons of mass destruction. So then I'm over in Kuwait. After a few days in Doha, we go to Kuwait and you're told when you hear the sirens, that means we have reason to believe that there are nuclear warheads coming at oh, us. Jesus. So you have to put on your gas mask and they train you where you, you say gas, gas, gas. So everybody knows, like put it on and you exhale to get any potential gas that got on your mask, and you're just hunkering down, waiting in a bunker with the military or wherever you are. 3 a.m. in your hotel room, you hear the, you're like, I'm going to die alone in this hotel room in Kuwait. Um, That was the scariest. Um, And we we didn't know. I remember, and then you get the all clear. Then when they hit a different siren, that means, okay, false alarm. You can take your mask off now. But I remember sitting there in a bunker with um, the fine men and women of this country serving our military. And I was shaking like a leaf. And these young kids, afterwards, we got the all clear and they're just carrying on talking. Oh, coming up to me. I love Big Brother. Hey, can can I get a picture with you for my mom? And And I remember thinking like, why am I hosting this silly little show called Big Brother when, you know, we're at war and this is real life and, you know, what a frivolous show, what a frivolous job that is. I was doing Big Brother at the same time I was covering the news in the morning and the news show was the one that sent me to cover the war. But when I saw all the joy and, and appreciation from 
these men and women, I thought, well, it's not a, just a silly little, a silly little reality show. It kind of it brings it brings families together. I've found that Big Brother has reunited family members that didn't speak or didn't know each other. You know, found on Facebook. I have this cousin watches Big Brother, or like, oh, that's the show I grew up, you know, watching with my dad. We didn't get along, but we always got along when that show was on. We'd watch it together. You know, so I hear things like that. But the scariest thing was. Um, thinking you're going to die covering a war. What about the most embarrassing thing? Because you're sometimes you're live, right? Yes. Um, I would say two embarrassing things. One was when I was co-hosting the early show in the mornings at CBS. We used to have these concerts on Fridays. And we had, do you remember Cisco? He sang the yeah. thong yeah. song. Oh, yeah. 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 Do we ever. <laughs> and there was a little bit of drizzle out and after he gave, after he finished his performance, I have to walk on and interview him. And as I was walking on, I slipped and both feet went up in the air like scissor kick and bounced and landed on my backside. And the worst part was that Cisco couldn't stop laughing at me. He oh, couldn't no. even do the interview. He was laughing at me. And I didn't hurt myself, but that was embarrassing. But the other thing was embarrassing in a different way. It was, I was working at the talk and we would always record the show live to the East Coast. And when we were on, the verdict came in for the Casey Anthony trial. She was accused of killing her daughter. And that was super heavy. When she was found not guilty, I had to I had to read it live on TV and and I and I and I broke down and I started to cry and I thought that was so unprofessional that I couldn't even speak. I had to push the copy to my co-host and have her read it while I just, you know, lost it. And that was. Does it ever hard. get hard? Like I always ask doctors when they come on, is it hard to separate the work from the emotion? Because I could imagine that would, even as a mother, when you bring that up, it's, I mean, it's hard to stand in front of someone and say that. I can only imagine is it hard to separate the two? It wasn't hard until 9-11. Yeah. Oof. So in 2001, um, after 9-11, and in the aftermath, in the in the weeks after... Um, I even get the chills when you say that. Yeah, I had to interview this, this, this widow, and she lived in New Jersey, and she was telling me how she didn't even know how to balance a... a a checking account, a bank book. And she was probably in her 60s. She had relied on her husband for everything. And I remember thinking, and she held it so together, was so poised. And I had to excuse myself and, and use her powder room so I could close the door and cry. That was when I had a, um, the first experience of not being able to separate and then two years later, when I was sent to the Middle East to cover the war, I remember asking um, a high ranking member of the military, like, you know, you have a wife and kids back home. And I didn't ask him on camera, but I said, how are you so brave? And he said, in the military, ma'am, we learn to compartmentalize. Uh, and I tried my best to do it, but when I had my first and only child in 2009, anytime, even just reading at home, a story about a child or children being harmed, I, I, I couldn't hold myself together. That became very hard to report on the news anytime I had to. Yeah, I don't think you can fully, I mean, nobody wants to read about children being harmed, obviously, but when you have children, it changes it completely because you understand the relationship that parents have and that you have yourself with kids. I mean, it's just like, it's such a heavy bond thinking of anybody going through, even if you dislike, I mean, you just can't imagine. Anyone you feel the through. wound. Yeah. You feel their pain because mm -hmm. you put yourself in their shoes and you know exactly what they're going through. And that's what cuts so deep. Yeah. Like it could be, it could be the worst person in the world and you still would never wish that pain on them because you just know right. what that is. All right. Yeah. yeah. To take a plot twist. I think with what you do, there's it requires a certain level of charisma. Is that something that you naturally have 
Or is that something that you have, you refine, or is it something you had to totally learn? Well, I feel like it's something you have to naturally have. But charisma, you have to have the it factor, which is, and I learned this from my first news director in Dayton, Ohio. He said, people have to care about you. You have to register. Either they love to watch you because they love you or they love to hate you, but they can't look away. So, you know, if you think about some of these broadcasters who have, you know, big names and big successful careers, they have a lot of haters. They have a lot of followers, but they also have a lot of haters. You know, you kind of divide the nation. So not everyone can be Oprah Winfrey, right? She defines charisma. I don't know. I feel like everybody loves her. She's very relatable. But I found myself watching some people on cable news channels that I couldn't disagree with more and get a visceral reaction out of me. But I found them just mesmerizing. I couldn't I couldn't turn away, you know, just they captivating, but not necessarily in a way where I'm like, yeah, I totally agree with you. I'm like, what is this person saying? But yeah, I guess they were charismatic. They were charismatic. I almost feel like love him or hate him. Donald Trump is like it's kind of what you're saying. Like you, you almost can't look away from him. Yeah. And trust he has his faults and his and but he is charismatic. Yes. He's Nobody's interesting to watch. I yeah. mean, he is. You have, when you say that, that's who I think of. Yeah. But you start but I you know, there's also some of these characters. you wonder why certain anchors or people break through to levels that others don't. You know, like they have exactly what you're talking about. It's just this thing where it's like maybe they're similar saying similar things, but they they're saying it in a way where you can't disagree or not. You can't turn away. Right. You they get they get a reaction out of you, mm -hmm. whether it's good or bad. Yeah, you know, running this business and not doing the show, I always I always tell people like you don't want to play the middle. Right. That's the worst. Because nobody because you just end people up people are indifferent towards you. Yeah. They're not thinking about you. You're not staying with them. You don't have a presence. So you ha you need that presence. Yes. Yeah. What do you think in 2024 makes someone have that it factor? Whether they're hosting a podcast, whether they're wanting to get on the news, what's the recipe? One thing that has absolutely changed my life is switching my entire home to non-toxic. So we moved from LA to Austin and I decided to switch all our cleaning supplies to a non-toxic brand, Inter Brand Basics. It's free of fragrance, hormone disruptors, and harmful preservatives. Everything is safe enough to use around your kids or your pets, your husband. I'm a big fan of this because I feel like so many of the products that I was using, especially in LA, were so toxic and had so many chemicals and Branch Basics eliminates all the stress. I personally would start with their premium starter kit. This is going to replace all your harmful cleaning supplies in the home in one swoop. They also, and this is important because a lot of us are using like chemical filled soap. They have this new luxurious gel hand soap. It's made with only the safest ingredients to nourish your skin. I found out when I got my blood tested that I was high in triclosan and this soap does not have it. It's the best. I have it in my kid's room. I'm such a fan of this brand. It's all non-toxic. You can find it at branchbasics.com. Save 15% on your starter kit or their new hand soap when you use code skinny at checkout. Branchbasics.com. Again, that's code skinny and you get 15% off when you purchase a starter kit or their new gel hand soap, branchbasics.com, code skinny. One way to make your life so much easier is Thrive Market. Thrive Market has all my personal go-to grocery and household essentials. Everything is delivered straight to my door. I get my raw almond butter, my apple cider vinegar, my Himalayan salt popcorn, and even my kids' candy from Thrive Market. They have this candy. I'm not joking you. It's the best. It's like yum, yum earth. And it's all natural. It's delicious. They have like a peach licorice. I put it in their Himalayan salt popcorn. All my groceries are ready to be delivered with a click of the button. They have everything you need and they do all the digging for you. So they have like organic kids snacks, which I get low sugar alternatives or gluten-free pantry essentials. You can curate your entire shopping experience with a few clicks. 
And what's the best part about Thrive Market is you save money. So on every single grocery order, you're going to save like 30%. Not only have I saved so much money on Thrive Market, I've saved time because they just pick it. They curate it for you. It's the best. Join in on the savings with Thrive Market today and get 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift. Go to thrivemarket.com slash skinny. You get 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift. That is T-H-R-I-V-E market.com slash skinny. Thrivemarket.com slash skinny. Let's talk about one of our favorite partners, one of our favorite partners, because I know when our audience uses this, they are changing lives. And that is the farmer's dog. They are changing their dog's lives for the better. We spend so much time as individuals and humans thinking about our health, our well-being, talking about so many great supplements and products that we can use for ourselves. We do not spend nearly enough time talking about the individuals who love us the most. And those are our dogs, our pets. Unconditional love. Everyone that has one knows this. So why aren't we putting a greater emphasis on what we feed them? The farmer's dog makes and delivers fresh, healthy food right to your door. It's developed by vets, nutritionally balanced, and made from real meat and veggies to the safety standards of human food. It's the best option for dogs of all stages because it's not kibble. It's not canned goo. It's just real healthy food. Like I said, why would you not be giving these pets real healthy food the same way you give yourself? Traditional dry and wet dog food options are highly processed, can use much lower quality ingredients than they claim to, and are extremely difficult to portion accurately. The farmer's dog, on the other hand, isn't just fresh, higher quality food. They also send the food pre-portioned specifically for your dog based on their unique nutritional needs. This makes it easy to help your dog maintain their ideal weight, which is one of the biggest indicators of a full, healthy life. Dogs at a healthy weight can live up to two and a half years longer. Who doesn't want their dog to live longer? Get 50% off your first box of fresh, healthy food at thefarmersdog.com slash skinny. Plus you get free shipping. Just go to thefarmersdog.com slash skinny to get 50% off. That's thefarmersdog.com slash skinny. That they have something different and unique to say, a perspective that makes you think. You know, maybe it makes you angry. Maybe it makes you think. Maybe it makes you laugh. But you're learning something from them. So you have to be a personality, unique, interesting to watch or listen to. What about when it comes to discipline and being militant? And is there is there things that you practice like to, from a tactical standpoint? Well, yeah, you know, a lot of it started all at home because my dad, I watched him every morning be like dressed in a suit and tie and out the door by like 6, 10 a.m. So to me, that was normal for him to get to work from Bayside, Queens to Newark, Newark New Jersey. He had quite a commute. So. And also my parents being Chinese immigrants where, you know, they stress discipline and academics and respect, you know, it's in my DNA. Um, And you have to feel your purpose. You have to have that drive. If you want something bad enough, you're going to do anything it takes to get what it is. Like my son, who's 14, right? He doesn't love to study. But if he could tell you how many wins and and kills that he's had at uh, Fortnite, you know, or, you know, he's like, oh, you know, I can't retain all that, this all this information. I'm like, you used to play Magic the Gathering, which I still don't understand. You've tried to explain to me or this the game Catan. I'm like, you have the capacity to retain information, understand very complex things. So it's all about having the, the drive and desire. I always felt so much sympathy for kids who get out of school and they don't know their purpose in life because they don't have a strong passion for anything. If you have no interests, then how do you know what direction you want to move your life in? So yeah, having the discipline is, um, and it's not just because you have the drive and the desire doesn't mean it's easy. You have to not give up and know that You're going to get a lot of doors slammed in your face and nose, and you have to just keep trying. I mean, I had four years of rejections before I I got my lucky break. People, they they don't want to hear that part. They just want to speed up to the success. Yeah, things are very different today than when I was getting into broadcasting because these influencers who have their own channels, whether, you know, They do one TikTok video and it goes viral and they can become these overnight successes. So, yeah, it's not like hard work 
always pays off. Sometimes you're just blessed with some talent. I think talent. there's pros and cons with that, though. So we've been doing, I guess, like not to age ourselves, but now we've been in, I guess, this digital space since 2010. So not so long, but it's been a while, right? Not yeah. as not as new as, I mean, b- before a lot of the term even influencer existed. And what I've seen now is you're right. Some people will go viral and have these overnight successes, but then they may not have the staying power. But what's I almost think it's worse because you grow so fast and you get a little taste of success and maybe some money. And then all of a sudden it's like, wait, it's I'm not there anymore. So I always tell people like, you want to have this slow, steady, consistent growth that's lasting. Going viral, which I know a lot of people want to do, is not necessarily always a good thing if you don't have the staying power or the chops to continue to push that boulder uphill. What's that quote about slow success that I sent you? Slow success and fast success? I don't remember the exact quote, but you, Lauren calls it all the time astronaut syndrome. Like someone goes viral all of a sudden out of nowhere and they go to the top. Like uh, astronauts, when they go to the moon, they come back down and they become depressed, a lot of them. Because uh, they've, like you've they've gone to the moon. Peaked. Yeah, everything else is going to pale in comparison. And, and also, like, if you've gone to the moon, zillion. like, are you going to go, what, well, imagine if you go to the what moon, are you going to do? Yeah. Like, right you, away. Yeah. You know? So I think that that's how it is to go viral. It's like you go to the moon and it's like you haven't had the foundation. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. And I think uh, we just had a, a therapist on and he was talking about this theory of the pearl theory. And he was saying, like, every single day you just want to get to the next pearl. He was saying a lot. He works with a lot of actors and successful entrepreneurs. And he was saying that sometimes when you have that kind of fast success and there's either critics or people praising you, you start to kind of like live in a different world where you, I mean, you're familiar with this um, and you've seen people that do this, but he's saying what he tries to teach them to do is just focus on putting the next pearl on the string. Like rather you have a big win or a big loss, it's just your job is to just keep putting your feet forward and doing what you're supposed to do. Staying present, staying in the now. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, Tomorrow's not promised, you know. Sure. Yeah, you got to stay focused and yeah, one step at a time, one foot in front of the other. How do you stay so humble and down to earth in this business? Because this business is cutthroat. Yeah, I think what has helped me is that I didn't get my start at an er- like the age that everyone else did. You know, I had to eat humble pie for four years. You know, I wasn't, I was 25 when I got my first on-air job where all my friends from college, you know, 21 upon graduating USC journalism school, they all got their first gig. So I had to watch them all kind of bypass me. And during those four years, I worked behind the scenes at ABC News here in Los Angeles, you know, in their big heyday. I guess, you know, they're having it. They're still successful. They've, they've stayed on top for a very long time. And some of the personalities I would see come and go, the biggest names, some were humble and gracious, even though they were at the top of the game, and some were not. And I saw what I did not like, nor did I want to become that if I ever achieved success. So being a little bit more mature when I got in front of the camera has helped. And also, I got two older sisters. They're going to keep me (laughs) humble and in my place. It's funny, too, because everyone talks to like like when I'm with someone who's doing my makeup or my hair, everyone talks. You hear you hear it all. Yeah. So if you're an asshole, it's like your rep. It, it's it's quick too now. Oh, yeah. You hear it. Oh, yeah. And now with social media. Yeah. Like yeah. everyone has yeah. a platform yeah. to broadcast it. Yeah. Yeah. What was it like without social media doing what you did? How what is the differences? You had a lot more privacy. Yeah. And you didn't have as many agendas or lies um, out there in the public. But on the flip side to what Michael was saying, if no one's talking about you, yeah. you're like, you can say anything, you know, it's better. <laughs> it's better for them to be talking about you than not talking at all. But it was easier. It was a simpler time. You had downtime. And you didn't have as much anxiety and you had privacy. You know, I like being I like being on a mic, but I also love my privacy. I mean, yeah. I, I don't I don't know how people can give up all their privacy. That's a huge thing to give up. Well, I think we we talk. There, I, I I think you ha- reached a level where you, know, you were known. It's too like you could people knew because you were you were 
on television so frequently. You couldn't, I mean, I don't think you just turn it off. Like, it's not like, hey, I don't want to do this today. Like, it's it, it happens. I think there's some people that go so far, like Oprah can't just go wherever she wants. It's, it's too late, right? Yeah. Um, I think some people now live in this sweet space where it's like, you're known, but also you can turn it off. And it's maybe not in that rare Oprah air. But I always empathize. I know, you know, sometimes we treat celebrities as like zoo animals to be observed. Yes. And like, we, you know, take their time. And I just, I always remind me like, these are people with, prof- and, and, and they don't have a choice. They've reached such a pinnacle that and they, they always have to be on. Yeah, they have to. Don't you want to take a picture? What an asshole. You know? Oh, right. Right. Oof. You know, even we experience like sometimes if I'm with my kids, I'm really, I always want to do everything, but if I'm with my kids, I'm like, ah, oh, like this is maybe not the moment because they don't have the context. Yeah. But you don't want to be an asshole. I heard Paul McCartney say once, he said, I don't do pictures, but I do have, I, I do have conversations. Hmm. What is your name? You know, hmm. tell me about yourself. And it was such a nice way for someone to feel like, oh, I have my own personal experience with Paul McCartney and he wasn't. He wasn't ungracious. The only know? thing I would say about that now, though, is everybody wants that Instagram. Everybody wants I that know. TikTok. You might not be able to get away with it now. But then they do treat you like a zoo animal. Yeah. They don't even want to talk to you. They just want to show off. Yes. Like, look who I'm with. Yeah. It's a it's a weird world because I w- we were speaking yesterday at CES and I was saying what, what I hope to accomplish with our children is to point out that this is a great tool and a communication device, but you don't want to end up being an end cons- like a constant consumer of it. Does that make sense? Like you want to be able to, you want to be able to distinguish, like, are you a consumer or is this something that is useful in your life? If you're just constantly scrolling and looking and clicking like that, that's not good. That's not adding any value to your life. And I've been there. I've, all of us have been there. Yeah. I'm like, it's 345 in the morning. Like how many puppy videos can I watch on Instagram reels? (laughs) And like, Like, why am I up at two in the morning watching a monkey on a motorcycle? I don't know. But I'm there. I'm there. Yeah. Was there... I was reading here that maybe you didn't grow up with religion or you didn't grow up with faith. Is there a culminating or cultivating event that helped you find religion? I know we're going to talk about your audio project, but first God, but was there something that pushed you towards religion? Yes. I will say that my mom uh, decided at age 17, she wanted to practice Catholicism. Her mom was Buddhist. So because she made when her you were own- you 17 dis- or she was 17? When she was okay, 17. Okay. So she didn't want to tell me and my sisters what religion to be. She wanted us to explore the world and figure it out for ourselves. But I did grow up always seeing this crucifix on her wall in the bedroom and one that she wore around her neck. And my father, when I was very young, used to wear a gold cross around his neck. But we didn't ever go to church as a family. Then I went to a Catholic high school, but that was more by default because I didn't get into the science high school that my two older sisters went, attended. And my mom didn't want me to go to the public school where I was zoned. So, but even then, like everyone I went to high school with, they had been in Catholic school since kindergarten. And the classes that you're taking in religion are, it was like morality class. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't starting from ground zero, so I, I didn't know, I, I didn't have religion in my life. It wasn't until I was 48 years old, and I'm 54 now, so I was busy, busy, busy. I always had two jobs. Then I was co-hosting the talk and doing Big Brother and raising my young son who was in second grade. And my life and my identity as I knew it came to a screeching halt. I lost my job at the talk and my husband left his job at CBS and our big fast paced, glamorous life as I knew it, going to Grammy Awards, going to, you know, out to dinner events, all these things, Super Bowls, that all came to a halt. And I had to stop and ask myself, like, how am I living? Why did this happen? I need some answers and I need some (laughs) guidance. I had no direction. So I started praying to God and I went to church for the first time. Um, I, and it was prompted by my aunt, who is a born again Christian, and she is my favorite aunt. She helped raise me. She saw publicly you know, what I was going through and she sent me an email and she said that her friend from a church, her old church in New Jersey had been 
praying for me and my family. And her friend said, Holy Spirit spoke to me and told me to tell you, you need to teach your niece about Jesus Christ. So in this email, I'm reading, oh my gosh, like here's some lady who I've never met praying for me. And, you know, my aunt said, listen, you know, I've never been pushy about my faith. We have a big family. She's like, I've never tried to push my faith on anyone. My uncle, her husband is also born again Christian. He's a cancer survivor and he survived being in one of the two towers on 9-11. Okay. So, and they're born again Christian before 9-11 after his cancer survive, you know, surviving cancer. So that email prompted me that morning to go to church. And it was a Thursday morning. I was driving my son to school and there are three churches right by my house that I have driven past millions of times. And I just went into one that sounded good. And I don't know if it's normal, if they normally have their doors unlocked before nine o'clock in the morning, but the doors were open and I had the whole church to myself and there were some candles burning. And no service going. No service going you know, Thursday morning, like 825 in the morning. And I just, I broke down, I got on my knees and I broke down and I started praying to God for help, for answers, direction. Um, I was just a mess. And I, I looked up for once, you know, I had always had my head buried down in my work. And I, what I realized now was I was praying to my false idol, which was my career, and my jobs. I mean, everything came behind all my jobs, even even when my son was born. You know, I was having a baby nurse or a nanny so I could go on assignment. I could, you know, be at work at this time and not be the one to take him to school. It was terrible. So I had to kind of flip the script on how I was. Sometimes I feel like, and I do this too, you use work as a distraction. Oh, yeah. Work is a great distraction, you know. Like similar in a weird way to like alcohol or drugs that someone would use, but it's work. So it's healthier. Yeah. And it's like, I have to. And it keeps you on a track, right? You know, you can't do anything. Sorry, I can't right now. I got to go. I got to go be on TV. I got to read this. it keeps you out of trouble. Yes, it does. it's, It's a weird kind of almost addiction distraction. Yes, yeah. When you could justify that it's a good habit even because you're driving results in one area. Like so hustle you, culture. Yeah, a little bit. So when you when you find religion, what do you think the main changes in your personal life are? Like what do you I guess what like what are maybe the, the the shifts in your mindset when before and after? Oh, well having faith changes everything. Because if you have faith, nothing can rock you. You're going to still have bad days and tragedies in your life, but you know that God has a plan and he either allowed it or he ordained it. But nothing, he's sovereign, nothing is going to happen that he is not in control of. So what really shifted for me was getting to know God and it didn't really start to crystallize until the pandemic because 2020 hits and, you know, everyone has high hopes. Ooh, you know, 2020, it's a special number. It's like 2020 vision. Boy, did we have 2020 vision. <laughs> and that January, my father unexpectedly dies. Sorry to hear that. And then in March, I right? That, but I'm sorry to hear that. March 17th, God puts the world on pause. And we all have to examine our lives and how we're living and is this how we want to continue? And there's no distraction. And there's no distraction. And because of this lockdown, no one could go to church, but church can come into your home. I forgot they stopped. Yeah, because all the gatherings. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So people were having services online and different churches were trying to figure it out. And one of my oldest friends from my first on-air job in Dayton, Ohio, who was one of my favorite cameramen, he had since, and this was like 1995, he had gone on to um, seminary school and became a pastor of a church in Boston. 
And when my whole life was turned upside down, this friend reached out to me and I hadn't talked to him in like 20 years. And he said, um, my wife and I are praying for you. His wife was our six o'clock producer in Dayton. So we all worked together. And I thought like, wow, you know, at a time where suddenly you find out who your real friends are, people who, you know, were your work friends, you can't help them anymore. Like the phone kind of stopped ringing from certain people. And someone who I haven't talked to in almost two decades is ringing me up at a time I can't do anything for anyone. And he's there to help, he and his wife. So I started attending their online Zoom church and it was so homegrown. They were in their living room on a box. You know, all the members of the church were on boxes. My mom started Zooming on and that really began my spiritual journey. Because prior to that, it wasn't COVID. I would check off a box. I'd go to church on Sunday. And then the rest of the day, I go back to my normal life. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't tell you by Monday afternoon, what was the sermon I just listened to Sunday? It was just something you were doing. Yeah, yeah. ticking a box, yeah. thinking, oh, okay, I'm I'm being a good child of God. I went, I showed up. I mean, in the beginning, I was so naive. I used to bring my cell phone into church and like check emails if I got if my mind started to wander. So I was I was clueless. So, I think this is an important conversation, though. What you said about your son, about the babysitter, and and how you're in church scrolling your phone because you're being honest. I think so many people aren't honest like this. So it's refreshing to hear. All right, you guys know that I cook with Caraway's products. I use all their pots and pans. So I use them for bone broth, eggs, pancakes, all the things. And the reason I like their pots and pans is because everything is made without any toxic materials. So nothing has PFAS, PTFE, or PFAO, or any of those other hard to pronounce ingredients. But they just launched the best situation ever. So introducing Caraway's Kitchen Gadgets, five essential kitchen tools designed with performance and aesthetics. I just got these. These are so good. There is like a pizza cutter. It cuts the best slices. There are so many products that we have in our home that are made with toxic ingredients. And to know that Caraway is just looking out for us and we don't have to think about this is amazing. So everything that comes in their kitchen gadget set, I literally just got it, is made with polished stainless steel. It's non-toxic. It's sturdy. And it can outlive any of your old dull kitchen tools. Visit carawayhome.com slash him and her. And you can take advantage of this limited time offer for 10% off. So you get this on your next purchase, 10% off. This deal is exclusive for our listeners. So visit carawayhome.com slash him and her, or you can use code him and her at checkout. Caraway, non-toxic cookware made modern. I am someone that loves to streamline my life in every single way possible. And I'm really trying to get better with travel. One thing that has helped me immensely is figuring out my cosmetic situation. <laughs> I have a lot of skincare. So enter Base. Base is created by the actress and model Shay Mitchell. And basically, she set out to design the perfect luggage that's fashionable and functional. And one thing she really hit is functional. It's so cute. Like the cosmetic bag I have now is adorable, but it's also so functional. And come to think of it, her entire luggage collection is fashionable and functional. I would recommend going to the site. They have different colors. I like to use their cosmetic bag that's probably meant for makeup for my skincare. So I'll put all my skincare in there and it's all organized and streamlined for my trip. And then if you want to go for the luggage, they have the most unbelievable luggage. Everything is just all about someone who is meant to travel. So if you're looking for luggage that has room for everything, they got you covered. Right now, Base is offering our listeners 15% off your first purchase. You're going to visit basetravel.com slash skinny. That's basetravel.com slash skinny for 15% off your first purchase. B-E-I-S travel.com slash skinny and get that cosmetic bag. Dr. Daryl recently came on the podcast. He's an incredible doctor. And one thing that he said that everyone should be taking is a digestive enzyme. And I feel like I've checked that box with Array. 
Array has the best digestive enzyme. There is this capsule. It's called the bloat capsule. And basically, it's a blend of five herbs plus one fruit-based digestive enzyme. They sell out all the time. Everything is meant to target bloat, so you feel relief quickly. But it's also just so good for you. Everything that they have put in this capsule is amazing. So I'm going to go through the ingredients and you're going to be like, wow, bromelain, which is for speeding food breakdown, ginger root, which we love, digestion stimulation, lemon balm is for gas prevention, dandelion root for liver health, peppermint for gas prevention, and even slippery elm. Everything is laxative-free, vegan, non-GMO, gluten-free, filler-free, and cruelty-free. The best part is Dr. Daryl just really recommends that digestive enzyme, and this is Array. Everything's 100% natural. It's such a great brand, and they have so much integrity. I've been taking it for three years. You can check out Array. You're going to go to Array.com, use code SKINNY at checkout. You receive 15% off your first purchase or auto ship order. That's Array.com, code SKINNY for 15% off. Yeah. I mean, I'll be the first to say that I did all that stuff and and I was so foolish. I didn't know it was wrong. I didn't see anything wrong with it because it's how I lived my life for 48 years. Right? It's how I functioned. And then now that I flipped that script, guess what? All that stuff was causing me anxiety. Now I have a lot more peace, huh. you know, and stuff gets done. It sounds like, too, you know, everybody come, you know, there's, A lot of self-help people that say if you can switch your mind into thinking that things don't happen to you but happen for you. And it sounds in a way that religion kind of helps. Who said that? Who said that? I don't know. Is it Tony Robbins or who's it? Louise Hay. Oh, Louise Hay. Okay. Well, anyways, a lot of people have repurposed it. I just repurposed it. But it sounds like with religion. I think I sent you that quote on Instagram. In a way, if you have faith, you automatically start to think that way. And maybe you think this is, you know, it's God's plan or whatever. But you start to stop victimizing yourself in a way. Does that sound? Yes. And you stop trying to control everything because uh-huh. you realize I'm not in control of anything. Yeah. But I can spin all I want, but this is going to happen the way it's going to happen. Mm-hmm. And I do want to make a distinction. Like, I love that you use the word faith because what I also learned in this journey is that because people are like, oh, Julie became so religious. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't know. If she was so religious. And it's not what I learned is religion is about rules. What I have and found and what I want everyone to have is I have a personal relationship with God. So my relationship with God is going to look different from everyone else's. So things that work for me to relate and talk to him, go to him and hear from him and feel his presence is going to be very different from from everyone else. So I could tell you what works for me and recommend it and you could see if it works for you. But, you know, like, I remember my sister was diagnosed with breast cancer two years ago. And I was like, you got to start praying. You got to start coming to our Zoom Bible study and our Zoom church and this, that. And she said to me, lay off. She was like, I pray all the time. And she doesn't go to church. And I, and I heard it loud and clear. Oh, that's what her personal relationship looks like with the Lord. My way is to meditate. Like I yeah. like to sit in silence or sit yeah. and just be. It sounds like your I think parents it's different for everybody. Quiet moments worship God. Yeah, I, I just do. I just like to be quiet and sit with my own thoughts. Yeah. And I think you're right. Everyone has a different sort of definition of what that looks like. And I have found I feel like when people say the word meditate to me, that is a form of prayer. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah, definitely. It sounds like your parents may be got that early on where they were religious themselves, but they are faithful themselves and they didn't really push that on you. I think my mom was, I'm not so sure about my dad. I think my dad wore the cross because I'm sure he was, you know, curious, but the way he and one of his brothers came to this country from Taiwan was because they were sponsored by a church. Uh So, yeah, I... And that was his own relationship. However, you know, he he spoke to God and what he believed. Yeah, I, I mentioned my grandmother earlier. She was Buddhist. She was a Japanese woman, a full Japanese woman. And my, but my mother, she married an Italian guy. My, so my mother, my grandma always practiced Buddhism, but my mother was raised Catholic, like very strict Catholic. Because her dad. Because her dad. Um, and then I 
my sisters weren't, but I grew up having to go to the Catholic schools early. I wish I could say I did well there. They kicked me out of every one of them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you were no, finding your way. No surprise. Yeah, I was finding my way. Um, and, and then going to church, but it was really heavy on me for like the first eight years. And then I kind of came out. But but I've always, like, I don't know if you call it God, but I've always, I don't know if it's specifically Catholicism, but I've always kind of been faithful, if that makes sense. Yes, spiritual, faithful. Yes. You have, and that's your own relationship with God. You've always been faithful to... I will say when it's stressful and Lauren doesn't even know this, there's this prayer my grandmother used to say at night and I say it in my head when shit gets... I'm going to ask you it tonight. Yeah. yeah. Will remember. you share it? Um, what is it? It's, how does it go? Because or the gist. Give us the. Essence it's like it's, of what... it's basically not only me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. I should die before I wake. I pray the Lord my soul to take. That's the. I've heard you say that. That's the that's the prayer. But that's that's a cath. That's like a. That is a Catholic. That's a thing. Catholic thing. What I also learned was because I went to Catholic school, high school, the last three years of high school. Every morning we had to say in homeroom, which they called core, the Lord's prayer, but that was religion. Because I was saying it by rote. I could say all yep. the words while I'm multitasking. I'm not connecting with the words. It wasn't until like now, post turning 48, that I was like, oh, our father who art in heaven. Like each sentence, each word, I fully connected with the messaging. Before it was just like rambling. When you feel stressed, do you tap into it? Yeah, you know, I have to say since I started a personal relationship with God, I don't really stress out. You know, and before when I would experience stress, I would tense up even more and try and control the situation and just spin. And then I would end up feeling like I'm running on fumes. Whereas now, like, what could I stress about? You know, raising a teenager. There's a certain lo level of stress there. Oh, great. Can't wait. <laughs> but don't you feel like, so I feel sometimes, call it faith, call it religion, whatever you want, but when life's hardest moments happen and you hear people say like, oh, I'm praying for you or I'm thinking, like I, I'll, even if you don't call it religion, you just call it energy. I think there is something about thinking good thoughts, yeah. not just, but, but to other, about other people, yes. which then will come back to you. And I, and, and so as I've matured, because I used to maybe be a little bit more resistant to faith and religion, probably because of the way I was raised and some yeah, of stuff. Yeah, if it's too heavy handed, you run the other way. But as I've gotten older, even if you think, of, even if you call it something different, like positive energy or thought or whatever, like I just think that that comes back not only to you individually, but to that person. And if you're somebody who's obviously thinking bad thoughts about it, like that comes back as well. So oh, yeah. whatever you decide to call it, um, I think if you look at it from that lens, it would be hard to find fault or reason not to think that way. The power of prayer is so is so strong and praying for other people mm -hmm. and asking other people to pray for you. And if you say you're going to do it, I always do it right then and there because you say it and then you're going to forget, mm -hmm. right? Just life gets in the way. And I have to say that when, and I get into this in, in my audio memoir, But First God, where I talked about the power of prayer and a medical miracle that involved me getting my hearing back. I had lost 80% of my hearing in my right ear one morning. And luckily, a very good friend of ours is an ear, nose, and throat doctor. I went in and he sent me right away to Cedars. And he said, yeah, you are suffering from something called sudden hearing loss. And no one really knows why this happens. So I go to Cedars and they say, you have a 30% chance of getting some of the hearing back. And I'm thinking, oh, as a broadcaster, you don't have to wear an earpiece. Now, granted, I wear it in the left ear, but then if my left ear is listening to programming and the producers, my open ear, the right one where I lost 80%, I can't hear anything else, right? And I thought, oh, this is gonna be detrimental to my career. So after, so at Cedars, they said, we're gonna give you a shot in your ear right now, and you're gonna have to come back a week from today and two weeks from today for two more shots and 30% chance you'll get it back. That afternoon I go home and I sign on to Zoom Bible study. And at the end, they always take prayer requests. So I said, here's what's going on with my hearing. And this prayer group is so powerful. They prayed for me and I learned 
I've I've learned how to level up, if you will, my my prayer life. You know, it used to sound like a dear Santa letter, like I want this, I want that. Please help me with this. Now it's like I'm praying for other people, and I learned when it's a medical matter, you pray that all the medical staff, doctors, nurses, technicians, everyone laying hands on you or handling your case is guided by God's wisdom, that they have God's wisdom to reveal and diagnose and treat you. It's not like, oh, I'm going to sit at home and not get medical attention and pray it away. No, you got to go to the doctor. And those are the prayers. So they prayed for me. So the next week I go back to Cedars for shot number two and they make you take an exam first, you know, a hearing exam. The doctor walks in the room. He goes, well, I can't explain it, but you got 100% of your hearing back. Wow. He said, you're here now. If you want this second shot, we can give it to you. I'm thinking, no, thanks. I'll pass on that it's needle. It's a shot like directly in, directly in your ear. Uh. And because it's the medicine is cold going in your system for about like 30 to 60 seconds, the room is spinning uh, until it, it heats up to your body temperature. And I said, no, if I don't need that, sec- I'm good. I, I'm good. And I just kind of like bounced out of the room. Yay. And I didn't think much of it until a couple of weeks later, I went for my annual checkup with my general practitioner and she's part of the same. She's also part of Cedars and she walked in with her file and she goes, I've never in my career seen anything like this. How you got your hearing back is, I can't explain it. That's when it dawned on me. And I said, well, I can explain it. And I told her about my prayer group. I said, that's the power of prayer. I said, it's God. And she goes, why don't we call it faith and science? I said, absolutely. But to me, God is science. Yeah, I think the- He invented science. The, <laughs> all I think the so, where people become resistant, in my personal opinion, this is with anything, is when someone has a very strong perspective or opinion. And it's like, I need to push then that way of life onto you because my way is right and your way is wrong. Yeah. And I think you can never get through to people. And I, and I think sometimes, and I, every religious group has been guilty of this, there are sects of each religious group that do that and make people feel that way. Oh, that is, here is a quote that I love and I, and I don't know who said it, but preach the gospel, if necessary, use words. So by that is if you walk the walk, you don't have to, you know, talk the talk. You don't have to uh, lecture at people. If people see you living out the life that, you know, boils down to two commandments, right? Jesus said it, love God first. And right behind that, love one another. Every other commandment falls into place. You don't have to memorize anything else. That's it. If I love God first, he comes first. And that's why my memoir is called, But First God. It's also a wink and a nod to the catchphrase of Big Brother. But first, but first, Chen Bot. I like what Charlie Munger said about the commandments. He said, um, envy is the worst one of the, because it's the only one you can't have any fun at. <laughs> <laughs> I never heard that quote. That, I like that R.I.P. One. That's funny. Yeah, it is funny, right? That is a good one. You okay over there? I'm okay. I I just had like a cough attack. I swallowed something down the wrong pipe. I'm so sorry. First you had the tickle, and now the, yeah, the, the wrong on pipe. On and on and on and on. Well, we um okay. we had a whole. Hold like, on. It was really important. We're gonna uh, no, I have I you. have I have a couple questions. I want to get you out on time, yeah. but I have a couple questions. The first question you have to give us some skincare, beauty, hair tips. Okay. It was God that did it. God gave her the, the skin. <laughs> <laughs> well, that I prayed about actually, my skin. <laughs> actually, peace makes you glow. So that is peace a Peace does. Because yeah. when you look at someone who has like a, a, you know, wrinkled up, like scowling face, they, they're they having a hard life. They've had I 100% or, agree with you. It's You could see the energy on the face. All right. I, I use a bunch of different products in a rotation. And... Let me just say, I cannot say enough about Oil of Olay. You don't have to spend a lot of money. I use three different of their serums and the old school pink uh, foundation, uh, not foundation, um, moisturizer 
that moisturizer I don't use every day, but maybe like two o'clock in the afternoon, if I'm walking past it in my bathroom, I keep it out on the counter. I'm like, oh, you know, I could use some hydration. I'll, I'll put some on. Um, serums, serums, serums. You have to do serums. You have to layer it. I try and do at least three different products on my face every morning and sunscreen. Um, I mean, and oils. I use Dr. Lancer products. I use Revive, Oil of Olay. Um, yeah, those, this Korean brand, Korean brand, the, the Korean brands are always top notch. What did I do to you today? He asked for a vitamin C. I said, try this the Korean, uh, the Korean vitamin C. I said, you're going to be surprised how much you like it. They do have top notch. Top. It's so innovative. Like well, they, it's they everything. They make it a, a priority. Skin is a priority there. I mean, yeah, look. I mean. We have a saying, Asian don't raisin. See, the bad uh -oh, thing for Michael, me is. Did you get the Italian part? I only got a quarter of it. And so oh. I'm hoping that, you know, maybe just like a fourth of my face will not age. But, but Italian mm -hmm. also, because, you know. You're like me. We have um, melanin. Yeah. You know, if if you're too fair skinned, that is very sensitive to the sun. Yeah, I mean, we my grand. I told you, my grandma just passed, bless her soul. But she was 93. She went and got her hair done that day. God bless her. Went to sleep. That was it. I'd like my and hair so done. Everyone's that's asking. The, you know, my I'm of course I'm sad to lose my grandmother, but I'm like, listen, that's a good life. You know, 93, no sickness, no illness. Happy, you know, get her hair done, went to bed. Is it? What do you do for your hair? I have learned, well, now that I'm north of 50, I've stopped washing it every day, ah. which has been very helpful. And also, as you get older, your oil glands start to dry up. So I don't have to wash it every day. And I put in this leave in conditioner. They say at least 10 minutes before you shampoo. But I'll sleep with that thing. <laughs> and it's by Lenore Grail, and it's a hair oil. I'm going to buy that right after this. Lenore Grail. Lenore Grail. Yeah. I have it's in to... a glass, a rectangular, square I'm going to get it. Lenore Grail. I have to ask you, because this podcast is so much about routine and habits. Are there things that you do in the morning and the night all the time? Like, are there things that are non-negotiables for you? I'm assuming prayer is one of them. Yes. Prayer... In the morning, um, I will always read from five different devotionals. And I do it on a Zoom call with my producer and we ping pong lines. So we read it out loud and we, we have a great time with it because sometimes like one of them is uh, called Jesus Calling. Another one is Jesus Listens, written by the same author. One is Hope for Each Day by Billy Graham. One is... Um, uh, I forget the title, but it's by Timothy Keller, who passed, a, I think, in the last year. Um, it's like wisdom, Proverbs. And then the last one is Grace for Today. And that's every morning. And then I will tend to listen to some sort of, um, like, Pray.com has um, a Bible, Bible in a year, so you can listen to it's about maybe 15 minutes in the morning as I'm brushing, flossing, washing my face, doing all the serums. I'll listen to, uh, I'll put on speakerphone, you know, on my, on my phone and uh, they'll read you some scripture and then they'll have like a dramatic retelling of, you know, what was happening there in the Bible. Um, I'll listen to those. So that's pretty much my morning routine. And then at 10 a.m., I'm always doing some form of exercise, whether it's Pilates or traditional weight training, stuff like that. And then um, at night, Jeopardy, DVR it. Um, and then the nighttime routine is I will pray more informally um, in bed. At times, my husband and I, we will pray together out loud, usually if there is someone we have to pray for. And I've got away from that for like the last probably four weeks. I have to revisit that one. But Things are busy during the holidays in your defense. It's pretty, I mean, it's yeah, so chaotic. Yeah. Yes, the time. Yes, yeah. you're right, the timing. Yeah. Um, but I started a Bible plan. So there's a great app called YouVersion. And um, you meaning, you know, Y-O-U, you, me, you, YouVersion. And it on the on the phone, it just looks like a brown cover of the Holy Bible. And they have a reading plan called 
Bible in a year. And um, we're starting at the beginning. Um, and I'll listen to that Shakespearean sounding actor who's reading, you know, a few uh, chapters of the Bible, like three or four chapters in, in the Bible. And then there's a woman who will then break it down and, and tell you what she got out of it. Um, and that I'll do morning and night. I'll bookend it sometime in the morning and then again at night. And, and I'll put my AirPod in and I'll keep listening to it over and over until I fall asleep. Well, now we don't have to just listen to Shakespearean men. We can listen to your pretty voice. Thank you. But first, God, where can everyone find, buy, support what you're doing? Anywhere and everywhere audiobooks are sold. You okay, can download. And there's yes. even on Amazon, you can even buy a CD if you want a tangible, if you still have a CD player. CD. Yes. That is Some cool. people do buy CDs. Some, you know what? I Some people take a CD player and put a CD in a, in a hospital room. Oh, because someone's in the hospital that they love. So they take a CD player. I did this for my grandma and I put Bossa Nova music on. So a CD is not always a, a bad idea. Couldn't you just put like a like an what iP an iPod or like a phone or she didn't have a phone. She had like a, an old flip phone. Michael, come on, get with the time. Then get your grandma an iPad. Oh, God. <laughs> but first, God, where can everyone find you and support you? What's your Instagram? Pimp yourself out. Julie Chen Moonvez. And I post a new show every Sunday called God 101, where it's a panel talk show. It's about 12 minutes long. We we give, hmm, we talk about today's world and how to find peace, love, um, loving your enemies, all sorts of topics through the lens of scripture. Thank you for coming on, Julie. That was such an interesting conversation. You're welcome to come back anytime. We covered Thank a lot you, of ground. Lord. Thank you, Thank Mike. You, Julie. Thank you, Julie. Thank you both.